I think that we all agree that randomized clinical trials are the standard for clinical research. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, there are several shortcomings with the present randomized clinical trials. And the uh, first one is shown here in the next slide. This is from 1990 to 2002. As you can see, drug development is full of disasters, or if you want, withdrawn out of the market. Not only in preclinical in green, approximately 72%, but you look both phase one, phase two, and phase three are plagued with abandons. Now let's see more recent data. If you look at more recent data, please know the reasons for termination, uh, the development programs of new uh, entities, new chemical entities. The first reason is the lack of efficacy. And you see here phase two trials, and you can see here that uh, things didn't change too much between 2008 and 2012. Approximately 59% of the compounds are abandoned when they are in phase two because they are not effective. Jesus, why? The question is very simple. Why these compounds, even look at this, phase three, 52%, they said, are ineffective. Why we waste all this time? If they are not effective, why do we test it in humans? That's the first question. Second, please note in, in red color, some of the compounds, the problem is safety. These compounds produce adverse effects that are, no, uh, are indicating that they should not be uh, continued. But please note also that in phase two, there is something in green color, and I'm going to use this very elegant word, strategical reasons. You will see what the strategical reasons means. And of course, the problem is that approximately two thirds of the compounds that have been tested in humans never will be commercialized. And this means that we are wasting time, we are wasting money, we are wasting neurons, and the things are not best. Reasons. Of course, the main reason is you are thinking, oh, no doubt, efficacy. Then you move here, you say safety. But please note this bar. The main reason why clinical trials fail is because we did not recruit enough patients. Surprise, right? We did not recruit the patients we need. We waste time to recollect all these patients. But please note here, note here, this is funding a business decision. Look, for the last 50 years, this is just the opposite to oncology. Oncology now is in the gold area. They discovered one compound, new compounds, new compounds. Yes, but it's very simple to explain. Because for 40 years, the people were treated with uh, anti-cancer drugs that I studied in the School of Medicine. Things changed very recently in the last seven years. But if you look at the area of cardiovascular diseases, we have a huge explosion during the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, a lot of compounds. So the new compounds now, they need to be at least as effective as the previous one, and of course safer. And I'm going to put you one, these strategical reasons. History of antihypertensive compounds. You'll see the last, the last new family of compounds is 1995, because I, I'm pretty sure that any of the people in this audience will prescribe a least green, right? So for the last 25 years, there's no new compounds. And there is something that is not written, but we know pretty well. It's difficult to, deliver, to develop a superior drug in an area where a previously highly effective blockbuster went out of patent. Blockbuster means that a compound sells a billion US dollars per year. In the case of hypertension, we don't have one blockbuster. We have atenolol, we have enalapril, we have amlodipine, and we have losartan. So who is going to invest the money to develop a new antihypertensive? Any of you? Uh, all these compounds are cheap, effective, and safe generics. Are you going to waste uh, 1.5 billion US dollars to develop a new antihypertensive? And the answer is no, it's no. We are very happy because we have a new compound in chronic hair failure, Entresto. 
the first compound in 15 years. Do we have new compounds in the last 35 years in antiarrhythmic area? Uh, Vernacolan for a few patients and Ronederam for a few, few patients. So now you understand what means strategical reasons. I'm not going to invest money to waste time and to uh, obtain a compound that probably will be not. Uh, so this is very important. The, this is from Jack 2015. Look at this antineoplastic. It's all, all, everything is efficacy. We didn't have anything against uh, renal carcinoma or lung carcinoma. So oh, no more, no, another, another, another compound. But look at this here in cardiovascular. The main reason for attrition is commercial reason. We have too many compounds. Uh, so this is a real problem for most of us. Hmm? And now this is a very, a slide that I prepared for the last meeting in Rome last year. These are the failures in acute heart failure for the last seven years. There's some new compound. Please look at the last month New England Journal of Medicine and you will see Ularity should be added here. And I, here, see, see mech, here you have the mechanism, ineffective, 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 ineffective. I mean, that's a big disaster. But occasionally, the problem is not only that the compound is ineffective. The problem is that it produces important adverse effects, like seizures or stroke or impaired left ventricular. And look at this. I develop a compound for the treatment of acute heart failure that produces a depression in cardiac contractility. Jesus, what, what we are doing, no? You know, hepatotoxicity, increase the risk of heart failure, fantastic. We develop a compound to increase the, the incidence of heart failure. Uh, the question is, why we fail? What we did wrong before this? And for me, it's here. We are always, oh, phase three, I want a phase three. No, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, we have animal models to determine drug efficacy and safety. I'm a basic research, and I have a mix, basic and clinician. Animal models I will criticize in the next slide. Please note that we do not develop much interest for phase two. Phase two for me is critical, because phase two is where we must reap move from animal models to patients. Phase one is in human healthy volunteers. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to give a drug to a healthy volunteer, uh, to a healthy people. I'm going to, uh, to, to prescribe a drug in a non-healthy person. So it, this is for me a critical phase. This is the dose finding, which dose? Uh, it's terrible what somebody published in New England or a Jack and the, uh, the final conclusion is, we did not reach a statistical significant difference, probably because the, the, the dose was not the most suitable. Okay? So, second, we must confirm the mechanism of action. We saw the mechanism of action in animals, but this, this target is in humans? Is in the human disease? It has been validated in humans? What about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics? Yes, this compound produces this effect, but please do not forget that drugs has not one single effect. You have many effects. So all these off-target effects should be analyzed. Which is the dose, as I already mentioned, which is the best time at, in a patient with acute heart failure? When, when I must give the compound? In the first six hours? Because if I gave the, the compound, I recruit the, the, I recruit the patient after 48 hours, this drug is not going to be effective because the time at which I administered this drug was the wrong one. And finally, what happened with comorbidities? Because the animals they don't have comorbidities. Patients in phase one do not have comorbidities. So how comorbidities affect the effect of my drug? So a uh, criticism about animals. Uh, 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 once again, I remember you that work with animals. So more than 25% of the, of the uh, drugs under in, in clinical trials fail because of poor pharmacology. Poor pharmacology is that, uh, as already mentioned, that. Uh, what we found in animals, I found many times that are not suitable for patients. Second, animal data are useless on, to indicate the effective drugs in, in humans. Uh, point three, animals. For me, this is my uh, 
favorite sentence every time I gave a lecture to my students or to clinicians. A mouse is not a man, and a cell is not a tissue. Okay, I work with isolated human cardiac myocytes. This is not the heart, because human cardiomyocytes are only 30% of the mass of the heart. And uh, so, and then there's something. Every time, every, every, every week, I open the, the, the news, somebody found a new treatment, a new gene. It's published in nature, in science, oh, fantastic. But look at this paper published in Nature uh, a, a few years ago. Believe it or not, how much can we rely on published data on potential drug targets? That's a beautiful question. And they said, well, as you can see, some results were reproducible, 65%, but at least one third cannot be reproduced. Uh, this is for me, people like me, we are pressed to publish data. We publish the best data, but uh, results that uh, can average, I mean, the best, uh, they are impossible to, to reproduce because every time I send my manuscript, they say 5,000 words. Uh, methods mm, in supplementary, uh, nobody can reproduce my data. And sometimes I cannot reproduce the data of my friends. And we need to go from one lab to the other to, to realize that, yes, you get this data. Second, scientists do not have to show their, their work. I can go to any of your hospitals and say, show me the data of your patients. But you cannot come to my lab and say, show me the data on your animals, okay? Uh, positive results are much easier to be accepted in good journals. Look at this. Null results never were written in 70% because why I'm going to write this manuscript? It's not going to be accepted. So I know that this drug is not working. I know that this is, this is going to be a failure, but I'm not published that. And finally, now there is, a, there is an increasing number of what I call predatory journals uh, to expose thousands of scientists offering to publish their work, of course, for a fee. Every, every week, I think, I receive at least three invitations to, show, to send a manuscript. Well, if you pay, I publish very, very easily. Careful with this. So for me, the first point for my talk is we must know the drug before pivotal trials are performed. So. As I already mentioned, about half of phase two and three uh, drug candidates fail because of the lack of efficacy. So once again, I remember you, phase two is critical. Drugs with novel mechanisms of action enter phase three trials without adequate proof of concept studies in humans. We need to confirm, as I already mentioned, the mechanism of action to validate the target, the pharmacokinetics, define the drug, the time, the best, the best patients. This is some, I mean, People I, will continue with her failure. Pharmaceutical industry wants a drug for everybody. Do you think that the pathophysiology is the same hair failure with a patient with ischemic heart disease that with a patient with hypertension or a patient with diabetes? And the answer is no. So it's not a surprise that the drug is not effective for everybody. It's effective for some subgroups. But they don't like this because we want a, a drug for all seasons, for everybody. And uh, this is doomed to failure at the present time. And this is one of my biggest toughs. I, I, I can't tell you that I spend uh, difficult times trying to, 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 to fight with some companies on this point. And then we have a new beautiful compound. Yeah, but this compound is not only for this. Uh, this is typical for people working on cancer. They develop be few beautiful compounds. And now they are surprised that they produce hair failure. I have two friends last 12 months die. Of course, they were suffering from cancer. They were cured. They were cured with the new compounds, but they die of hair failure. And so people now say, oh, and women with, with uh, breast cancer, they die with thromboembolisms. Well, is that a surprise? No. Why is it not a surprise? Because the same target that you find in the, in the cancer cell is in the vessel or is in the heart. And you always look, the people in cancer look like this, you know? They, this is the cancer cell. No, this is the cancer cell. But here we have many other cells, right? And of course, this phase two is very important to check the safety data and also the possible drug interactions. 
It's a pity that a compound that is in phase three suddenly the, the, the company came and said, we are not going to continue with this drug because it's a very potent inhibitor of CYP 34A. I mean, we knew that he was an inhibitor of this P450 cytochrome isoform uh, two years ago while we continue the development. And finally, uh, the safety data, and this is a, a real problem because we do not have tools for predictive toxicology and pharmacogenomics. But the second point for me is this one. As you can see, 80% of clinical trials fail to meet milestones. Uh, you say, oh, it's incredible. No, it's true. Clinicians do not realize that. Uh, look at this. Uh, wh what happened? CROs and sponsors rely on traditional recruitment and retention uh, tactics. You see, uh, physicians, they ask you, they ask to have a, the site selection and support, and uh, they are completely wrong. I'll show you what they must do. The enrollment rates, they vary from region and region from 75 to 95, and of course people in, in Latin America and Asia, Pacific, uh, achieving the highest rates. Uh, I think that we need to change all these things. First, uh, we need to replace site by consortium, there's no doubt. And this is, I, I'm going to present you many data on cancer because they are very clever. You know, and they did it many years ago in Tampa, Florida, the Murphy Center, the cancer center, 18 hospitals compiled the history, tissue samples, and genetic information of each patient from now till the next 25 years. So they have a huge, incredible uh, database. We need to face technical barriers, develop patient consent and standardized forms to record clinical data, unified databases, uh, high quality secure uh, integrated information system among hospitals, of course, and a single review board uh, committee. Of course, this is not simple because every ho hospital wants to be the leader, you know, and uh, each institution brings, uh, this is a sentence very elegant, its own values. No, it's not own values. I want to be important. You know, I don't want to be included in a consortium. So this is uh, all values, preferences, and interpretation. So this, to set all the system that I propose in this slide requires an enormous trust. Uh, there are new ways to recruit patients. Probably you uh, don't, well, you know it, that people publish millions of data every day about themselves. Approximately four million every day. So we have a huge database with, geotri with the geographical distribution of possible high quality patients and sites. And sites. So I can select the, 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 the hospital to be included, not only the patient. Second, if I scan all this information that is in the web, that is online, I do not have problems with confidentiality or coercion. Third, there are special software analysis that analyze the, 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 what you sent into the, in, 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 your, in, your, in, your, in your web. So I can understand if you are suitable to be included, if you are confident with pharmaceutical industries, if what you think about the hospital, what you think about uh, Professor Tamargo that will be included in, 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 in the trial. There are companies that much sponsor and patients interested in, in participate in clinical trials. Patients organizations, uh, I, I can tell you that in my country, for instance, if you want to perform a study on kidney diseases, you go to a kidney transplantation uh, web and uh, you will have patients for your trial immediately, immediately. There are marketing campaigns that potential uh, targets follow we can pay Twitter banners, and there are something, uh, this, this is a new institution in the United States, it's a support organization offering nursing, nursing-focused patient recruitment and retention solutions for globally clinical trials. So, you see, I, I'm not going to go to your hospital to see a big name, a big name. I can do it just at home, clicking, you know, I, and I can identify where the patients are. Uh, but there are some this is a paper that published uh, in New England last month. I already said there are some countries that recruit a lot of patients. But have a look at this. This is the famous Topka trial. You remember, spironolactone was tested in two European countries. Well, 
Russia and Georgia. And you say, why? The, not Germany or France or United Kingdom or Spain. Because there was, not mo there was no mo money around. Okay? And the Americans. And look at this. This campaign is pretty effective in America. But it's not effective in Europe. What are you going to do now? Are you accept these companies for the Europeans? And probably you said no. This is what happened. And was published very in, in one page of the New England last month. Uh, they asked to the Russians and the people from Georgia, do you take the pill? Yes. 100% take the pill every day. They asked the Americans and said, well, uh, no, we, the, the, we are 20%. We did not take the pill. So probably, we, it was a surprise. So even if the Americans didn't take the pill 20%, 15%, it was effective, the compound. Here, the patients take the pill and it was negative, the trial. Let me remember you something. Spironolotone has a metabolite. I'm going to measure the metabolite. Jesus, the Americans, the Americans, I found the metabolite. But I do not find the metabolite in the Russians, even if they say that they are eating, taking the pill every day. Huh. Why the drug didn't work? Because the people didn't take the pill. Fantastic. But they say yes. They say yes. We take the pill, 100%. So this was a fake, clearly, right? I, I, very polite, very polite. That's terrible. So, have you ever checked if your patients are taking the pills? Sure. In this case, it was very easy. You see, uh, the, the Russians, if you increase the dose, you do not increase the metabolite. The Americans, if you increase the dose, you increase the metabolite that is secreted in urine. urine. And finally, if you take spironolactone, I would expect that your kalemia will increase, right? Yes, but not in the Russians. Fantastic. This is another reason for failure. Next point. Clinical trials are more and more and more complicated. That's fantastic. We need to address requirements of regulatory authorities, medical community, papers, patients, and so on. And we the clinical trials generate a huge amount of data, approximately three hours per week hunting for clinical trial-related documents. And Tuff Center, one of the most important in the United States, analyzed how, you see, analyzed 10,000 pro clinical protocols. And they found that between 2000 and 2003 were approximately 106 procedures for protocol. Now, now at the present time, it's 158. So it's impossible that we can handle all this information. And we use uh, information in a non-secure, inefficient, and not reliable audit methods. It's cost and timing consuming. So why we don't go and we use the cloud? So we have a platform that is located in the cloud, wherever, and it's going to help us and supplies the infrastructure and provides support, exchange timely, faster, and more accurate information related to the startup conduct uh, and safety trials. Uh, this is something that at the present time is absolutely necessary. We cannot handle the information by ourselves. We need cloud computing. And now we are accustomed to this type of trials, you know. A single dose is compared with placebo, uh, uh, optimal rotation against placebo, or this, all this, all this. These are traditional ways. We are wasting time and wasting money. I'm going to propose this. Look, this is the old time. We have four different arms, the placebo and drug A, B, and C. We perform a phase two trial, we stop the trial, we analyze the data, and then we start phase three. Why we don't do the same following? We continue the trial from here to the end of the trial. But please note something. Here, once again, I have four arms. But at some time, I realize that one or two of the arms are not effective or are not safe to compound. Why am I going to continue with these arms? 
Why well, I'm going to continue for eight months if I know from the second month that this is non useless. So that's what I'm going to propose. That's what we call adaptive designs for clinical trials. First of all, the design is planned prospectively and use the accumulating data from subjects in the study to decide how to modify aspects of the ongoing trial. So I start the trial, I analyze the trial, and I decide, do I continue with the trial or I stop the trial? So sometimes I stop the trial, but sometimes I continue the trial. I'm going this, and so I'm refining and refining the clinical trial. There are different, there are different rules. This is... It's, it seems easy. This is very difficult to perform, you know, because uh, prospectively you need to, to de determine at each state how new patients will be achieved, uh, the sampling rule, how many patients will be sampled in the next stage, so we drop the losers and save cost. We are stopping the rules, the stopping rule, how to stop an unsuccessful trial, and uh, finally, a uh, uh, fourth rule is the decision trial. I'll show you this one. This is the following is a comparative study between a uh, compound, this is a new compound, this is uh, dulaglutid here, so we have all these doses here, and as you can see, we start, first of all, these are patients with diabetes mellitus who were exposed to metformin for six weeks, and at this time, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven doses of this compound and they were compared with citagliptin. And after a few week, months, you see here, 26 weeks, it's quite clear that these two low doses and this dose and these two high doses were not indicated. So we continue the trial with only 0.75 and 1.5 milligrams once daily. And we continue the trial until the week 104 with these two doses. We save first time, we save patients, because all these patients, these patients here and here and here and here and here, they were added to the two arms that were effective. So I enrich my trial. Second, I stop the arms that are not effective, and I get all the information, phase two information and comparative trial in, in, this, in this way. I recommend you, I, I think you all know Deepak Bhatt published this, this paper in New England in 2016. It's an excellent because it's four different examples. Another change. We are accustomed to the following. I present a drug application to the EMA in London and the answer is yes or not. And if it's yes, I continue with pharmacovigilance, so it's a very simple answer, yes or not. But I have a compound that I think is effective, and I would like to propose you the following. I, I'm going to develop this compound, suppose that it's in cancer. I, suddenly I realize that this drug is effective in a very particular type of cancer. So I apply for, for request for authorization, but I continue with the investigation because I'm pretty sure that this compound will be effective in different types of cancer. Infliximab. Do you know how many applications has infliximab by the FDA? More than eight. More than eight. So I apply my first request, probably for Crohn's disease, but I continue because I'm pretty sure that will be effective in, in arthritis or in whatever. So you see, I get an initial license, and afterwards I continue continue the investigation, the pharmacovigilance, I will continue and I will get a full license after a certain period of time. So this is the idea. Up to now was yes or not. From now on is I will get a first indication, then another one, then another one. But of course, this is a basic principle in this, what we call adaptive licensing, is make innovative drug access easier through an early approval and acknowledgement uh, but without risk for the patient. Another thing that we can I already criticize animal models, but animal models are interesting for cancer development because mouse models faithfully replicate a variety of mutational events observed in human cancer. So we are going to conduct a trial in 
at the same time, in parallel, in patience and in animals. And what I'm going to do is to translate the data on animals to the clinician. So, as you can see, mice receive the same therapies as the patients. Uh, mouse, of course, allows more doses to be used in clinical trials. So you see, this is the cancer. I replicate the cancer in the mouse. Mouse and men are receiving the same treatment. And the data from mouse are translated to the clinicians so that we can modify the treatment according to this data. This is, at the present time, widely using cancer. And uh, there is another type of, of development that is also in cancer. Here is, again, for breast cancer. This is a study that has been a success because from this design, two new drugs were accepted last year by the FDA. This means these steady patients, this is ERG positive, ERG negative, they are randomized to the best, the best clinical uh, background therapy. In this case, as you can see, it's Paclitaxel and Trastuzumab, plus a new drug can be A, can be B, can be C. And here you have R negative, Paclitaxel, plus drug C, drug E, drug F, whatever. And we continue the treatment, and before you move to surgery, when you move to surgery, you get uh, biopsies, you get blood samples, you get tissue samples, and from this data, you come back to the randomization. So the people that will go into the trial, they will be treated according to the previous data. And as I already mentioned, this gave two new compounds. And cancer, once again, this is what we call a basket of studies. Usually we are accustomed to one arm for a patient with lung cancer. Another study for patients in colorectal cancer. No, 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 no. What we are going to do from now on is to put all the patients, all the patients that present a single genetic mutation in the same basket. And I'm going to treat all of them. And at the end, I will get a huge information. And probably I can ask not only for a single application in lung, but in lung, in ovarian, in myeloma, and so on. And the second one is what we call the umbrella. It's just the opposite. This is people with lung cancer, are going to be treated with different drugs, and we are going to see what's going on. So the umbrella trial means that we are going to test the impact of different drugs at the same time, at the same time, in patients who most likely benefit. So we are not accustomed to this type of trials, but you already have seen in the previous talk, we need 100,000 patients to the to demonstrate a P less of 0.405. I mean, this don't make sense. I, I don't know, cardio, cardiovascular, sometimes we make. So this is my two slides. Uh, clinical trials are too long, cost too much, are not efficient, are unnecessarily complicated. There are too many people involved. And sometimes I show you, some people can lie. Okay, I'll show you the data from the Top Cut recently published. They were liars. They cheat me. Uh, they are inefficient, uh, with site recruitment, site accreditation. Most, how, how many of your sites are accredited internationally? Okay. Uh, the contract, oh my God, to, ask, to sign. Con Eth ethics committee approval, patient recruitment, data verification is still mostly manual, means a lot of errors. So that's my slide, last slide. If we want to accelerate, uh, early clinical development, we need to understand the mechanism of action and the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics before pivotal clinical trials. Uh, as I already mentioned, is key, the phase two. In phase three, uh, we need to, for me, the most important thing is to incorporate primary endpoint based on the mechanism of action. And of course, safety is crucial. We need to keep the right patients. I told you, there is, for many new compounds, there is not a general application. There is a niche application. Look at the new compounds that are going to replace a polyrenone and spironolactone. Okay? Finerenone. Is going finerenone is, is developed for uh, chronic hair failure? Yes, but for a niche. Patients with diabetic nephropathy. Clearly, I found a niche. I have my position. I'm better than the other two compounds, spironolactone and pleronol, because I select a, po a population that has not been validated with the other two compounds. Focus on a specific subset of patients most likely to benefit. 
as I already mentioned, identified based on validated imaging and biomarkers, replace site by consortia with increasing harmonization, accreditation to multiple, to reduce multiple inspections, decrease bureaucracy, oh my God, this is impossible, at least in my country, I suppose that in, in, in Italy the same, everybody asks you for a new paper and more papers and more papers and I thought with the computers I will, I will reduce the number of papers and the number of papers are increasing on my desk and how, use the cloud computing and please became familiar with adaptative clinical trials. Thank you.